Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the next session. Um, this is Bitcoin in Africa, trends, challenges, and success stories. We have a lot of important people on this session, but I'm just going to be doing well to inter um, invite on stage only the moderator, my special friend. Please put your hands together for Tochi as she joins us on stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so without wasting so much time, um, right up for this panel session, we will be discussing Bitcoin in Africa, trends, challenges, and success stories. I would quickly want to invite KG Kathatu from Machankura. Please, a round of applause as he comes up. And the second person coming up on stage is Modibe Matsepan. <laughs> I hope I got that right. Please, a round of applause as Modibe comes up. Yes, so um, quickly um, introduce yourselves, tell us what you do, and probably something interesting about yourself or something you're involved with. Okay, I'm Khotatsu Ngaku, and I'm developing Machangura, which allows people to send and receive Bitcoin without internet connected devices. Uh, what's interesting about myself, I have a mixtape, a rap mixtape, so if you know what to search, you'll find it. So, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, what do you think? Um, Is it working? All right, um, my name is Mudibe Matsepane. I'm the uh, Africa master at Fedi. And um, most of you might have interacted with the Fedi app yesterday or today. But what we are building at Fedi is a, a community super app that allows people to um, interact with the day-to-day -day use cases without uh, cracking their brains. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so right up to the questions. Um, so what notable trends are currently driving the adoption of Bitcoin in various African regions? And how have these trends holistically impacted the Bitcoin ecosystem in Africa? Uh, I'll take the one first. So I'll mention two or three. But the first one is uh, the day-to-day -day use cases. Um, and I'm going to mention one of the organizations doing this very well. If you look at Bitcoin NKC in South Africa, they are doing this very well, whereby they are empowering young people with Bitcoin. But what they do different is they are not only focusing on educating them about Bitcoin, but they earn Bitcoin, which they then easily use, uh, you know, to buy this and that on a daily basis. And then we have um, an organization called BTC Hub in Uganda, where Meron is Estefanos is working with um, refugees, and what they do different is uh, their Bitcoin education is centered around like being hands-on. So instead of um, asking people to buy Bitcoin, they actually teach them how to do things uh, that they can earn Bitcoin from. And there's a booth at the back where they are selling some of their creations, which were made by uh, BTC Hub. Um, so in this way, people get to learn what Bitcoin is uh, by doing something and getting BTC, which makes it much easier for them to go out and spend it and understand how it works. So, so you mean um, they work to earn Bitcoin? Is that what it means? Yes, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So right now, in most cases, people are told to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. And if you look at the situation in Africa, there's not many people that have disposable income. So when you tell someone that uh, has little to no disposable income that they must buy Bitcoin, it's, uh, it's something else. But if, okay, so with fiat, no one has ever taught us how fiat works. But each one of us here knows how to uh, use the rent, uh, king shilling, Canadian CD, US dollar, because we earn it and we are somehow um, encouraged to use it to um, buy things that we need. So if we do the same for Bitcoin, it's most likely going to be easier for people to understand how it works. Mm. Awesome, beautiful. Mm -hmm. KG? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually thought he was going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer markets, right? Because, yeah, I feel um, for a few years, a few African countries were very hostile to Bitcoin companies. This is Kenya, this is Nigeria, this is you name it. And the peer-to-peer -peer markets have actually kept um, Bitcoin alive across the African continent and we are at a point where 
a lot of Bitcoin companies in Africa believe that they can continue operating regardless of whatever the government says. And I think that's important. The work that the uh, guys at BitNob are doing is incredible. Uh, the mm -hmm. work that um, the guys at Nuance are doing is incredible. The guys at Paxful are doing is incredible. Mm -hmm. The guys at Yellowcard as well are doing mm -hmm. is incredible yeah. because people still need to get access to their Bitcoin. Right? Yeah. And these companies are going out of their way to ensure that Bitcoin yeah. is delivered and um, all the other use cases as well we've heard about uh, over the past two days where you know, not just remittance but if a person is importing and exporting goods mm -hmm. uh, capital controls make it hard for them yeah. but if you find an OTC trader or uh, someone who knows how to get Bitcoin in that country you can continue doing your transactions and yeah, I feel that that has subliminally, you know, pushed adoption, and everyone now is coming to the park and say, okay, what are the other areas that we could uh, focus on? Which is what Moody was talking about with the work that uh, the Bitcoin circular economies are trying to push for at Bitcoin EKC, BTC Hub, and yeah, now it's just a question of, okay, cool, no more person on the street, does he have a bit, uh, Bitcoin wallet? What can we do to deliver that? Uh, hmm. Interesting, yeah. thank you. Uh, so next question, are there unique challenges in different African regions? And considering the challenges associated with regulatory uncertainties and financial literacy, how can industry leaders and policy makers collaborate to overcome these challenges and foster a more conducive environment for Bitcoin in Africa? I am of the opinion that Bitcoin needs to be banned in Africa. It needs to be banned in yeah. Africa. Uh, it's much easier to build when Bitcoin is banned because yeah, you are building in a very decentralized permissionless setting versus in a regulated setting where your government is incompetent and you're going to submit the application and wait for months unless you know who it is to give a kickback so that they actually process your application. So unless you're in a country with a functioning government, regulation is really a hindrance, right? Uh, regulation is going to slow you down. And also... Um, a lot of African governments are very old people that don't really know too much about technology. So the regulations that are being imposed are technically not written by them. They are written by somebody else, which we don't necessarily know who that is, and which we don't necessarily know who benefits from that law being written, that regulation being enforced. So, but that being said, um, I also believe that we should keep voting for the old people, you know, because uh, then we are free to do whatever we want to do with the technology. They don't really understand it. Uh, you saw what was happening in Nigeria with the Twitter ban and. Well, Nigerians kept using Twitter, even though Twitter was banned. Nigerians kept using Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin was banned. So, yeah, I'm of that humble opinion that yeah, Bitcoin should be banned in more and more African countries. Uh -huh. So we build permissionlessly and so on and so forth. Yeah, interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, on top of what you, you said, what I see been um, among the key challenges is how easy it is for people to access Bitcoin products and use them. Uh, most of them are still a bit complicated that your grandma cannot use. You're audible. Come again? Yeah, so uh, some of them are still hard to use. Uh, but you can see with people like KG taking something that people use every day and allow people to access Bitcoin with that. Um, and then the rest, I would say education as well has been mainly um, more traditional. So if you take the same way that we've been learning in school, uh, like government schools, and then you apply it in the Bitcoin space, it doesn't make much difference because most people, after school, there is very little that you can remember about what, what you learned. But if you can make it uh, hands-on, I think it will be more practical and enable people to uh, get involved in the space. And if I can just go back um, uh, to the question on successes, not to be biased, but uh, in South Africa, there is guys from Crypto Converted uh, that are doing something amazing. Uh, which allows everyone, uh, whether you're using Binance, Luno, Vala, you can easily pay for goods and services uh, at one of the biggest retail chains in South Africa, pick and pay, using Bitcoin. So in that sense, when a person wants to know what Bitcoin is, you can 
easily just uh, make a direct translation to money that they use to buy things on a daily basis. So it's uh, more practical, I think. Interesting. Yeah, um, so you know, moving away from the challenges and the barriers, um, can you share specific success stories where Bitcoin has had um, tangible and positive impacts on financial inclusion, remittances, or other economic aspects within African communities? Well, um, I think there's the guys from Bitcoin Do or somewhere in the fair, right, uh, who are renovating a technology center in their community. Uh, last year, uh, built, for, no, built with Bitcoin actually built a tech center as well. I, for, I forgot which community, I think it's Kamasu or something like that, right? And yeah, uh, there's been just a lot of interesting projects popping up all across the continent where people are like, okay, cool, we are doing this and we are using Bitcoin and we like to develop our communities, right? And well, I have a um, opposing opinion on remittances as well, so I'm not going to say it because yeah, I course. already said <laughs> the bad one, so yeah. For me, the first one I would say is uh, us sitting here on the panel uh, is proof of Bitcoin uh, for starting financial inclusion. Uh, we all work for Bitcoin companies. Uh, what I do is building one. For myself, I've now worked a fiat job, so I've always been working in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And we see many young people being uh, employed in the Bitcoin space, either by companies or building their own products, which they are using to empower other people as well. And then I would also say, um, um, in terms of remittances, cross-border payments, most young people uh, are educating other older people who can easily use Bitcoin instead of fiat to make uh, cross-border payments. In my case, I've had um, one person whom I didn't know come to me and asking to send money to the UK. And I told them how to do that. They still do that uh, even today. So they basically just buy BTC locally and then find someone to send to in the UK and the person make a payment on their behalf. So it, you can replicate that in a uh, business setting, uh, a personal setting, and you can you know do uh, forward and reverse, uh, cross-border payments, remittances, uh, pay bills, receive bills, uh, and the likes. Um, so rounding up, uh, because we are all running, running out of time, yes, yeah, so um, given the current uh, landscape of Bitcoin in Africa, um, what does the future look like for us now? Uh, yes, uh, okay. it's working. So the future in Africa, I would say it looks like um, we'll be going back to where we come from. And I don't mean that in a neg negative way. Um, with where I'm based right now, we're working on a community super app that allows people to take back their power, uh, money, data, and more, which can be done in uh, community settings. So instead of relying on giant organizations, people can easily work as communities to build uh, things that they can own and uh, belongs to them. So I would say community, real use cases, are going to drive change and um, exponential adoption in Africa. Beautiful. Okay. Um, okay, then to um, small background on my answer. Uh, uh, in the hip hop scene, like 2005, 2000, late 90s, there was a question like, what does the future of hip hop look like? Uh, yeah. um, the answer is um, e effectively hip hop artists. What does their future look like? Right? If you're a hip-hop artist and you get shot on the side of the street, then that means that the future of hip-hop is that, you know, a violent future, so on and so forth. So for Bitcoin, I guess it's a question of what does the future for Bitcoiners look like, you know? Um, you're looking good, you know, you're looking, uh, you're glowing. So I'd say then the future of Bitcoin is glowing as well, right? But if next year comes along and we look impoverished, right? And we look stressed and we look, um, you know, oh, one of us is dead out of, you know, circumstances involved in, you know, being involved in the Bitcoin space, then that was what the Bitcoin's future would look like as well. Okay. 
interesting perspective. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this panel session. Please put your hands together as we take our seats. Thank you very much. Thank you.